Thank you very much. So, there's uh, not so much time, and uh, I have to make uh, certain choices what to present, what not to present. On the other hand, I want to explain some basics. And uh, the basic idea is uh, we want to get information about the finite from the infinite. And so what we are uh, going to do is we study uh, probability in the arithmetic. And uh, in doing so, we go from a formal system of finitary proof rules to an infinitary proof system. And all the question is, why are we doing this? The extraction uh, of uh, bounds on, let's say, provable bell rings and uh, provably recursive functions requires uh, tracing back proofs, and the induction uh, axiom makes problems here. Now, if we embed a uh, finitary system into an infinitary system, we can get rid of the induction using certain omega rule. So what is the omega rule? Not uh, very specific, but basically, we want to prove formula for all x a of x. And instead of using a free variable, we just uh, prove a of k. For all k, we have infinitely many premises, and then we compute for all x, a of x. Using this rule, one can prove the scheme of complete induction outright. Now, uh, I have to formally define what we are doing. So I'm going to uh, system Pa infinity. So what is uh, crucial over here is that the terms will be closed. The terms are the same as for arithmetic. And uh, we have again our predicate variables. Um, we have the symbol for equality. We have uh, we build formulas using uh, implication, the symbol for falsity, and inverted qualifiers. And uh, then we have to uh, choose what type of uh, calculus we use. And we deal with the Gensen style calculus, so we form sequence, gamma delta. And the interpretation of gamma uh, dot uh, delta is that from the conjunction of the formulas in gamma, we can uh, obtain the disjunction of the elements in delta. And uh, this is basically uh, what one can learn in predicate logic. And then there is, uh, for predicate logic, the Gensen cutimulation theorem. And we want to mimic uh, what we know about predicate logic to the new situation. Now, in doing so, uh, we define a calculus. Where are the axioms? Well, since we have closed terms, uh, we can check well, if phi is a true atomic formula, the so true uh, equation between closed terms, and if phi is that in delta. Then I can derive uh, gamma dot delta. So if uh, something true is in delta, then we can derive this. And we can derive this uh, with all the order of complexity for the height of the derivation. And R is uh, just the one for the cut formulas. And if we just have an axiom, there's no cut involved. OK, if phi is uh, false, atomic. And phi is in gamma, then similarly we have probability of this one. Now, what uh, can we say about these three uh, predicate variables? Not very much. But if s and t are closed terms and the value of s is equal to the value of t, then uh, we can do what? We can derive gamma x of s dot delta x of t. Basically, we mean that from x of s, we can compute x of t when s and t are the same, uh, values, the same values. Now we have proof roots in our system. As follows, uh, we have implication in the uh, succedent or antecedent. So we have a shorter derivation of uh, gamma phi, phi delta. 
and alpha zero is smaller than alpha. And the formula phi implies psi is in delta. And we can derive uh, alpha and r gamma delta. We have the error introduction in the antecedent. So this is uh, <coughs> quite clear. So phi should imply psi. And if it's already in delta, then we can uh, basically remove those formulas and we can derive this one. So the formula which you want to prove is already uh, contained in delta. Now the implication is understand it's complicated because basically you're showing a uh, negated implication that comes down to a conjunction. So if we have uh, after zero r and r phi delta and alpha 1 r gamma psi delta and phi implies psi is in gamma and alpha 0 alpha 1 are smaller than alpha then you can derive alpha r gamma delta now we have rules for the universal quantifier and uh, the universal introduction for the succedent is the, the omega rule. Now it's important to have here infinitely many premises. So if you can derive phi of i for all numbers i, and uh, we have this is alpha i, and if you have a uniform bound for all these alpha i's, and that's the moment where it's necessary to work with this uh, ordinates and not just with finite numbers, because alpha i could be equal to i, the uniform bound for all i's would be the first limit ordinate. And in general, one can go beyond this. And if uh, for all this phi of x is implemented in delta, then one can derive in the model. Then the neural introduction. Since antecedent comes basically down to an extension introduction, because on the left hand side. So if I have the phi of k, and some uh, alpha zero of an alpha, and the formula for all x phi is in gamma. Now, this is an antecedent of implication, so it comes down to the formula basically meaning there is an x negation uh, of x. <coughs> then I have alpha r gamma delta. And then we have the so called capital. So if you have alpha 0 and r gamma phi delta and alpha 1 r gamma delta phi and alpha 0, alpha 1 are smaller than alpha and uh, now the question is what is the role of this r and r bounds the logical complexity of the formula phi so just uh, consider the defining tree for the formula phi this tree has a certain height and we assume that the complexity of alpha the rank of the formula 3 for phi is bounded by r, then I can conclude uh, gamma delta. That's our process. Now, what are the basic properties of this proof system? Well, most important for our purposes is uh, the proof of the complete induction. So, what do I want to prove over here? is the uh, following lemma, namely uh, omega many steps, I can prove that if I have phi of 0 and for all x, phi of x is phi, phi of f of x, then you can conclude for all x, phi of x. And as I said, we do this by applying the omega rule. And for this, I need a sublemma, but the uh, sublemma is somehow simple to prove. The sublemma is uh, 
with uh, two times the rank of phi uh, and zero. I can prove phi of s implies phi of t with the value of s is equal to the value of t. And the proof is like in predicate logic, you prove this totality, the basic coming down to the assertion that A implies A, modulo uh, prove the equality of the terms, and uh, there's nothing special about it. Now, how to prove uh, this one? And uh, for this one, proofs, um, well, let K be two times the uh, rank of phi. And psi is the formula, one of the premises for the complete inversion. And uh, our claim is then with k plus 2 times n and 0, I can show from phi of 0 and psi, I can conclude phi of n. And if I can prove phi of n for all n, then I take the uniform bond for all these numbers, and I get the formula for all x, phi of x. Now, how to prove this? Uh, that's uh, not difficult. So, by induction on n. If n is equal to 0, then I have phi of 0 on the antecedent and phi of n on the subsident. So, uh, <coughs> use this lemma over here, and here are done. Now assume that this is true for n. Assume. Well, uh, we can uh, apply this lemma also for the successor of n. So with k and 0, we get phi of successor of n plus phi of successor of n. And then we apply the error introduction in the antecedent. So both things together uh, yield k plus 2n plus 1, 0, phi of 0, psi, phi of n implies phi of s of n, phi of s of n. Now, the trick is uh, we use universal introduction as an antecedent <coughs> over this witness n, and what do we get is the formula psi. So, with uh, universal introduction as an antecedent, we are done. Because then this formula is the same formula as psi, and then I have phi of 0, psi, phi of s of n. Uh, we have done two steps in the proof, so from k plus 2n and two further proof steps, we get k plus 2 times n plus 2. And finally, we do in this situation over here. Universal introduction over all these n with the omega rule, and we get this formula. So what we have learned here is uh, how to prove the induction in this context using the omega rule. What one can do then is uh, one can do this cut elimination, which we uh, know from Gensen. So if we have here an alpha and r, gamma and delta, then as in the case of predicate logic, one can show one can uh, reduce this r to zero. And here, uh, one has to use the uh, expansion of 2. And the height of this power will be equal to r, gamma delta. Now, why is this important? Uh, right. The proof is basically what is known from predicate logic, but I will come back to this in a moment. The upshot is. Uh, if we can show alpha <coughs> the progressivity 
function of smaller x implies for all x x of x. Uh, if we have here proof of a scheme of the transfinite induction, then uh, one can exploit that we have a zero over here. We have here cut-free proof, and there are not so many ways to prove this formula in a cut-free proof, so one can trace back this proof. Now we build up an ordering, and if you have uh, no tricks available, this basically means uh, if you have n steps allowed, you can build an ordering of length n. If you have alpha steps allowed, you can build up an ordering of uh, height alpha. And the upshot is basically here, by tracing Wix approved, you can show that the order type of uh, visualization is bounded by 2 to the alpha. <coughs> it's definitely bounded theorem. And finally, you have to show if PA proves something. The formula of transfinite <coughs> Then uh, you can transform this derivation from the planetary system into the infinitary system with some bound uh, alpha here and some cut length over here. Then you perform the cut elimination. Then you get here an alpha prime and here is zero. Then you uh, explore this lemma, and then you have shown uh, that the order type will be bounded by 2 to the alpha prime. And if this alpha prime is, uh, well, it has to be less than epsilon 0 in the beginning, but uh, uh, if you have form proof in PA, actually you can embed this basically with very small ordinals. Omega times 2 will suffice. So we because most critical part is just the embedding of the induction. Then this other prime will be less than epsilon zero, and this will be less than epsilon zero. So showing uh, this argument shows that PA does not prove transfer induction <coughs> up to full epsilon zero because all proof instances will be born by small um, But uh, in my talk, I want to concentrate and a proof of the unprobability result on finite trees, uh, the result of Harvey Friedman. And for this, uh, I have to refine the methods. So how to do this? So we need uh, a classical result on provably recursive functions of PA. And today I want to concentrate on this one. Now, what's the idea? The idea is uh, we know how a wrong theorem works. A wrong theorem says if you can prove one version of a wrong theorem, it as follows. If you can prove an existential formula in predicate logic, and you find finitely many terms so that you can prove the disjunction of an f of first term or f of second term, etc. And these terms basically witness uh, uh, give concrete uh, instances of proofly request functions of predicate logic. Now we want to do the same in our context here. I want to extract uh, via some sort of a wrong analysis the proofly request functions of PA. So for what, uh, what, what I'm doing here is I start with an assertion in PA. We have the statement for all x they survive phi of x phi. <coughs> phi is let's say uh, Sigma here one formula, just an extension formula followed by bounded quantifiers. And I want to get, uh, depending on inputs x, uh, upper bounds for the ones. Now our calculus uh, is set up over here, it does not help us. Basically, uh, these uh, make the statements can be proved in the system with finite uh, bounds. They don't give information. So, and uh, when one compares this presentation with the previous presentations, what I'm doing is I'm setting up a calculus where I built in also some sort of uh, realizability. So the idea is uh, let f be a function from n to n and define a setup. f realizes uh, with alpha r gamma delta. And f is 
a function which controls the witnessing information <coughs> which I need to get bounce on the wires on the control. Now, how does this work? Well, you may wonder why I spend all the time trying to down the routine. But the trick is to uh, well, modify uh, all this. Namely, I define what does it mean f controls such a derivation. Now, uh, basically, if we are in the atomic cases, we don't need materialization. So here I just say, for all the witnessing functions, f I have this. If uh, here's an atomic formula, it's all not important for us. There's no uh, essential information involved. And all in this case, I can say, aha, uh, F controls such derivations. Now, uh, regarding uh, roots for the connectives, they don't concern information on extension witnesses. So, if uh, we have an F control derivation of this situation, then the same F should be able to control uh, also this derivation. And in the introduction for the, the error in the antecedent, well, this also does not affect uh, the numerical bound, at least in not in all case. So if f controls this derivation, and if f controls this derivation, then uh, f controls this derivation. Now it's not the case that we just transform every situation where we had no f, uh, just mm. kind of just like an f, uh, we have to see which situations uh, is uh, no more information needed. And these are the uh, roots with the quantifiers. First, I consider the universal introduction the antecedent. This comes down to uh, extension introduction. And of course, the witnesses k, if I want to have bound on the witnesses, then I have to put the witness somehow into f. So if alpha is less than alpha and k is bounded by f of 0, then it's, uh, f knows enough information about witnesses to control this derivation. Now, uh, what is the realizability of the universal formula? Well, we have to branch into the subderivations. And uh, for this, I want to have this type of implication. <coughs> but this is not going to work. Because uh, then I can't move derivation from the finitary system in a nice way to the infinitary system. So what is needed here is uh, f should uh, be, uh, this f here should allow be allowed to use information i. So what I'm defining is the notion of what is an enlarged operator, f i of m, f is an operator, f i of m is just a function f of maximum of i and m. So this operator also uses uh, information of i, and in this context I want to have that if I control this derivation. And for the cut, uh, there's nothing special. You can just use uh, f in both cases. Now, what the output over here is uh, as follows. Uh, if PA proves, uh, let's say, the statement of the form for all x, is y, y of x1, then there exists an f, basically a polynomial, uh, such that uh, there exists an alpha less than omega times 2, an r less than omega, such that this f can prove this alpha and r the same assertion. Now, uh, what's the point here? 
just assume that this r would be equal to zero. And I can look, how did I prove this? And I can trace it back. And then it basically uh, can be shown that the existential witnesses are all uh, controlled by the first value of uh, function f. So basically, how does it work? Well, assume that I have a derivation alpha zero for x is a y phi x y. Now the point is, of course, uh, this is not a sequence, but it's just uh, I here the empty sequence and then stops and then this formula. Now uh, this calculus is set up in a way that one can do inversion. So I invert to an m. And now it's important to see that for the inverse introduction I used uh, by invert to M and M. And I do not go to F, but I have to go to F in bracket M. Then I get uh, this extension formula. Now uh, one has to read uh, what does the extension formula mean because it has been defined in terms of uh, negation and universal, uh, universal uh, quantification, but there's not, not a big issue. Basically, uh, one has a country proof of such an extension formula. And the only way to prove this is <coughs> to have bounds on the y's in the zeros coordinate of f of m. And I can show uh, this f of m and i mean 0 is uh, upper bound for 2 y. So one can show by this that for all m, there is a y less than equal to f of m of 0, such that in the standard model we have uh, phi of m and n. Now, what is f of m0? It's just uh, f of m. So what we see over here is, once we have a 0 over here, 0 over here, then this f gives a majorization for the probably recursive functions of arithmetic. But uh, in general, we don't have a 0 over here. So the trick is now <coughs> to transform this derivation with uh, an R, finite number, bigger than zero to the situation where f is zero. When I can achieve this, uh, I'm fine. And uh, <coughs> to do so, I uh, now go to into the basics of cut elimination, and it will be the same proof with some modification uh, as uh, was necessary to treat the previous example on transfer induction. So I skipped that one because now I go to the more complicated uh, situation. What is needed here is always some sort of inversion, which I will not treat in detail, but uh, I will just mention it when it's needed. So <coughs> the most important lemma is the following, the so-called reduction lemma. So assume I have an operator G and a derivation of gamma phi delta <coughs> and operator F controlling a derivation of 
gamma delta phi. And I want to apply that to phi. And the rank of phi could be equal to r. Or less equal to r. They are not allowed to use a cut, and then I have a problem where uh, I have to replace a cut by some sort of extra element. And basically, so morally, um, one gets the composition of FSG showing uh, alpha plus beta times 2 uh, gamma delta. The composition has to be uh, set up in a text context so that, so that all these things go through. Mm. Well, what is the most important point here? For people uh, who know this, the critical case in the construction is um, we do induction on beta. Now, uh, we have to trace back uh, what has happened here. So the principal formula could be in gamma or in delta, all this is not complicated. <coughs> Interesting is when phi was a critical formula, and uh, I assume that phi contains a quantifier, starts with a quantifier, that's the most dangerous case. So assume phi is a form for all these phi. And what do we have is uh, we introduce uh, the formula phi. And then we have some beta zero, and it controls uh, this beta zero and R. Gamma phi psi of k. Okay, and uh, what we are going to do is we apply the induction of what is beta zero for some beta zero as a beta. I apply induction hypothesis to beta zero. So I get uh, f composed with g. I apply the induction hypothesis uh, with respect to this derivation and this derivation. So this means uh, I'm allowed to cut off uh, the formula phi. So I get here alpha plus beta 0 times 2 r gamma. The phi has disappeared. Uh-huh. That's good. But uh, that's not uh, the result because here's a formula uh, which is uh, which has to be removed. <coughs> now if I'm stuck in this proof, the basic idea is uh, whatever you run into problem, you did deduction on this side, and when it doesn't continue, you have to inform to use information of uh, the other premise. So here phi is a universal formula. So this means uh, you can prove somehow uh, inversion lemma, namely from for all x a of x, you can come to a of k for every k. So by a certain inversion, you derive from this situation f of k proves uh, alpha r and gamma delta psi of k. Now uh, we want to play cut. Cut for what? For this formula? Now what's the trick here? The trick is of course the rank of phi is less than equal to r. <coughs> now here is one quantifier missing in the complexity of psi. So the rank of psi of k is strictly smaller than this r. So I can apply the cut rule because uh, this uh, complexity is preserved. Uh, so cut. I get alpha plus beta zero. Uh, beta zero is less than beta. So I can uh, come to this. Oh, this looks nice, but uh, there is of course a problem, namely, I want to plug in F composed with G over here. Uh, now, F composed with G 
is already fine for this subdivision, but here is not uh, what I want to have. Here I need f composed with g, but he is <coughs> f composed with g is f of k. In fact, k is an alien. So why should f of k be controlled by f composed with g? Well, of course, uh, k is uh, completely arbitrary. Uh, this function would not measurize this function. So I would be stuck and I would get lost. And uh, the point is, by pure magic, uh, we have uh, used here the rule for universal introduction the antecedent. And if you look carefully, we have this extra information. If k is bounded by f of 0. And this is uh, helping us. Because f of k is bounded by f of uh, g0, so we applied uh, universal introduction for uh, g. So in this moment we have that k is bounded by g of 0. So f of k is bounded by f of g0. And now I assume that f and g are monotone. And then uh, I get this inequality, and therefore you see why you are introducing here the composition, and that's nice. So, so it goes. And um, now having the reduction lemma, one can show the reduction theorem. Namely, if f proves uh, with alpha and r plus 1, gamma, delta, then uh, I want to prove with omega 2, the alpha, and r, gamma, delta. So the upshot is we want to reduce cut rings here by 1. You have to pay a certain price, and then we go higher with the ordinals. Now the question is what comes here? We cannot uh, go along with the same f. That would be uh, too simple. Now the question is uh, what comes into play. And uh, we just go into the proof. And the proof indicates basically apply the Lackner process, and then you have to uh, apply the reduction lemma, which is over here. And basically, if you have a proof here of length alpha, then you have to apply uh, the reduction lemma alpha times, so you have to, to use an iteration, uh, composition of f, alpha times iterate. So basically, we have here a certain iterate of f alpha. Next question is, what is this? How can I iterate alpha, uh, how can I iterate function alpha times? That's not very fun. It's just a function and a plugging in alpha. Now I have to explain what does this mean. So I skipped the part of inversion. Now, uh, the point is, uh, I'm working with ordinals less than f plus zero, and every ordinal has a form omega to the beta plus gamma. Kind of normal form. And I say the term complexity of alpha is bound it's equal to to 1 plus complexity of beta plus complexity of gamma. Other measures are prime and 2 here. And what's important, the number of alpha less than epsilon 0 having a bounded norm. Well, it's just the uh, same as having a set of terms of bounded complexity. And if the signature is finite, so this number is uh, set so always finite. So this is a finite number, and in fact you can uh, give bounds on these numbers. So I use this complexity function to define what the alpha iterator of f is. So what is f alpha of number m? It is what? I take uh, an iterate of f gamma with f delta of m where gamma and delta are smaller than alpha. 
Now look, this is not going to work because uh, how should I do so? There are infinitely gamma less uh, gamma and delta less than alpha. So here I want to have the maximum, and we run into the problem that is not very defined. So we have to restrict uh, the choices for gamma and delta, and for this I just say the norm of the gamma and the norm of delta are bounded by let's say f of m. Suddenly, uh, this is a very defined definition, and uh, this function is fine. Now I have to say what happens if alpha is equal to zero. Well, I just, just take uh, the function f of m, maybe f of m plus one, just to start the recursion. <coughs> and then one is this one. Aha, uh -huh. that's good. But now uh, you want to see the details of the proof. And actually, uh, It's interesting in a sense because there's a problem. The proof does not work. So, why does the proof not work? Well, just assume that you want to prove this then. Proof of the reduction theorem. So, uh, we have. Uh, Premises, let's say the last flight rule was a cut rule. We have alpha 0 and uh, a plus 1, gamma phi delta, and uh, f alpha 1, a plus 1, uh, gamma delta phi. We apply induction hypotenuse. So we get here f alpha 0 controls with omega to the alpha a plus 1 gamma phi delta not here is r and here we have f alpha 1 omega to the alpha 0 alpha 1 a gamma delta phi Now we apply the reduction lemma. So what do we get? F alpha 0 composed with F alpha 1 controls. Uh, now we have here omega to the alpha 0 plus omega to the alpha 1 <coughs> times 2 uh, gamma delta. Now as I said, I want here to have that this is bounded by f to the alpha. So alpha 0 is smaller than alpha, it's fine. Alpha 1 is smaller than alpha, it's also fine. <coughs> but we cannot apply the definition because then we have to know something about alpha 0 and alpha 1, namely uh, the complexity has to be under control. Now, as it is, uh, it doesn't work because there's no information involved about alpha 0 and alpha 1. So the proof breaks down, but uh, the correction is very simple. Namely, you define the calculus in a bit more refined way, and you say the f alpha r proves the sequence, if and only if. Now I say the complexity of alpha is known to f. And uh, then comes the axioms and rules. So the measurizing function not only controls existential witnesses, but it also controls uh, numerical information about the ordinals involved. <coughs> And uh, then you verify that everything works. And in this situation here, if you have derived this statement, you know that the norm of uh, alpha zero is bounded by f of zero. And from this, you know that the norm of alpha one is bounded 
by f of zero. And with these side conditions, you can prove that one. And that's it. So that's nice. Uh, and uh, what you see is also you can recover this proof uh, just if you have defined the calculus, you do what is needed, and whenever you need something, it comes basically by itself. And the definition of the iterate is uh, somehow straightforward, some sense straightforward. Uh, you see that you have to use uh, information about the ordinates into your control operator. And what's also natural is that you plug in the witnesses which you finally want to measureize right from the beginning into your control operator. And then you have to show that your control operator uh, mechanism is stable under cut elimination. So when you have uh, information in your premise, that after certain transformations you don't uh, spoil the information. So you have to preserve uh, upper bounds for extension witnesses, but this is achieved by this construction. And so we achieve the bounds on the provably recursive functions. Okay, that's uh, basically the proof. I did a bit of uh, hand waving, and there are certain tricks involved. One trick is uh, the use of inversion. And actually, that's a tricky point. Inversion was um, if uh, you have a proof of f, of the formula, that if you have gamma and delta for all its phi of x. And then uh, the claim was, and I have uh, for all i, f of i proves uh, gamma and delta phi of i. Now these uh, lemmata, they look very, very innocent, but uh, if you really do a proof, you run into a complete problem. And if your setup with the Fs is not good, then uh, this will not work. Why does it work in this case? Because the proof is uh, you, of course, uh, do induction on uh, this alpha. And you consider the last case when this formula has been introduced. <coughs> so you have uh, introduced f of i, and then you have uh, alpha i r, gamma, delta, phi of i. But look, this formula can already be here. Uh, what's now the point? Uh, well, I want to invert this one. Well, this is nice. I want to invert it. But now the invert form is still present. So I have to apply the induction hypothesis to this formula. So induction hypothesis is f of i composed with i. Proves um, gamma delta. Um, gamma delta phi of i. And uh, our operator is set up in a way that one is here island potential. But if you would choose uh, different choices, a different choice of f would, so this is a very crucial property, and then the proof works uh, nicely. But if you would have taken another definition, uh, this is a pitfall, uh, proof, proof can, proofs can easily break down at this moment, but this is not going to happen in all contexts. So that's, uh, it for which has to be avoided. <coughs> um, what's left is uh, yeah. five minutes are left. So I will not uh, be able to tell much more. So assume that PA proves all x is the y by x y as alpha and r. Then use a finite number, right? Then we go into this f control setting. We get here something like uh, omega plus n r for all x is the y by x y. 
So now we reduce the first cut. So what does this give? It's F omega plus M. Here's omega to the omega plus M. And here's R minus 1 for all x is y. Blah, blah, blah. Now we uh, reduce the next one. So with F omega plus M, this iterated omega to the omega plus M many times, we get uh, Omega to the omega to the omega plus m r minus two for all this is one. And then you see uh, if we approach the zero over here, we get a term of the form f omega plus m omega to the omega plus m omega to the omega to the omega plus m. Voilà. And the messy term showing up over here. But uh, then you get here a certain alpha prime. Here's a zero. And this function then is uh, classifying uh, the algorithm over here. Now, what's the problem? You don't want to work with this term. Because uh, just try to, to do some calculations. Now one can show, well, all these ordinates of course more than f from zero. Uh, one can compute easily an alpha such as we call this f prime. That uh, f prime is bounded by a function in the Hiding hierarchy which I uh, defined before. How does one do so? Well, one has to go with these terms uh, by some iteration. And what is needed is uh, the Hardy function has a certain property, namely if alpha is smaller than beta. And the norm of alpha is bounded by x, then h alpha of x is less than equal to h. So comparison between Hardy functions can be done when oh, yeah, when you know that the argument x controls the finite information of alpha. Using this property and some calculations, which I will not do in the last minute, one can effectively show that this term here can be reduced. So appropriate alpha will have the form, it will be this number, omega to this number, plus and then comes the second term, uh, comes the second term. There will be certain omega power, and you have to take the natural sum of all these ordinates. And uh, for that you can show that. But this will be enough for today. Some questions? Always had a notion of H control derivations. Yes. Is that the uh, variant of that method? Yes. So basically, uh, this method has been designed after Buchholz's uh, approach. <coughs> and the problem is, the Buchholz approach works for uh, one notation systems and countable ordinates. And it's always a question how can you use uh, uh, information about ordinates to get information about finite numbers? Yes. And these functions really uh, are having a spirit of the Buchholz control, operator control derivations. Okay. And actually, uh, the operator by Buchholz has the same property. Mm -hmm. So they fit nicely together. Okay. Any more questions? If not, let's then speak again.